Hello, and welcome to Narcy's Guide to Dead by Daylight Survivor for Beginners. This guide will hopefully bring a person who is interested in the game up to the intermediate level without even having played a match. So let's get into it. Quick note before we do, this video will be broken into segments with timestamps in the description. So if you need a refresher on anything, refer to the timestamps and rewatch that part. Now let's get started. Dead by Daylight is a multiplayer asymmetrical horror game. Asymmetrical meaning it's a one versus four, one killer versus four survivors. With that being the case, the killer is really powerful against survivors who don't work well as a coordinated team. Dead by Daylight is interesting in that the killer's point of view is first person, whereas the survivor's point of view is in third person. Use your third person camera to your advantage when looking around and hiding from the killer. As a survivor, your goal is to escape the trial and, well, survive. The killer wants to stop you and kill you. In order to survive, you need to complete five generators, then the exit gates will power on and you can open them and escape. Completing generators is simple, as long as you aren't interrupted. Just hold mouse one and stay alert, as sometimes you will be given a skill check. Skill checks are triggered at random intervals when a survivor is doing a generator, amongst other things. You must press the spacebar at the right moment. Be careful though, as if you fail a skill check, the killer will be notified about your location. If you hit a great skill check, you will gain a bit more progress on the gen. Quick tip about skill checks, you will hear this sound effect when one is about to occur. Survivors in Dead by Daylight have three health states, healthy, injured, and dying. A healthy survivor can take a hit before going into the injured state. Healthy survivors can run and don't bleed or make noise. The injured health state is much like the healthy state, but now you leave a blood trail and cry loudly, making you easier to trap. You are also one basic attack away from the dying state. In the dying state, a survivor can only crawl and try to recover. If the killer leaves you, you will need a teammate to come over and heal you back to the injured state. When in the dying state, the killer can pick you up and hook you. Getting hooked is bad. Survivors have three hook phases. The first hook phase is when you are just put on the hook. When on the hook, you cannot do anything but attempt to get yourself off the hook. Do not attempt to get yourself off the hook. Wait for your teammates to come get you. If you attempt to get yourself off the hook, it will speed up your hook timer. The odds of unhooking yourself are very rare, so it's not worth the risk. The second phase on the hook occurs on your second time being hooked, or if your teammates don't save you in time. On the second hook phase, you must mash the spacebar to stay alive. If you are not saved or you are hooked one more time, the third hook phase begins, which is death. You have been sacrificed and failed to escape the trial. Because of these hook phases, it is important that you save your teammates before they are sacrificed. Just wait until the killer leaves the area of the hook to save. If the killer is camping a hook, try and save that person before they go into their second hook phase. A survivor on a hook takes precedence over doing generators, or anything else for that matter. You will know a killer is near when you step into their terror radius. The terror radius is heard through a heartbeat sound. As the heart beats faster, the killer is getting closer to you. Don't be afraid of getting in a chase. It will likely end in you getting hooked, but if all survivors just hide whenever they hear the terror radius, nothing will get done. Remember, just because you hear the terror radius does not mean the killer knows where you are. Here's an example of what the terror radius sounds like as you get closer to the killer.
During a chase as a survivor, there are two key mechanics that will help you make distance and escape. Window vaults and pallets. Window vaults are peppered throughout the map in many locations, and survivors can vault windows faster than killers can. At a window, you have three different vault types. The slow vault, where you are not running and vault a window. Slow vaults do not generate a sound. The medium vault, where you are too close to the window when you vault it. Medium vaults make noise and leave you open for a hit. And the fast vault. With good positioning, you can get a fast vault. It's harder for the killer to hit a fast vaulting survivor. Fast vaults also make noise. To do a medium or fast vault, you must be holding shift and running. The other tools survivors have at their disposal are pallets. Pallets are a finite resource, so use them sparingly. Pallets can be dropped on a killer to briefly stun them. When a pallet is dropped, it can be broken by the killer. If a pallet isn't broken, it can then be vaulted by survivors. Unlike windows, pallets only have two vault types, the slow vault and the fast vault. Vaults and pallets have many possibilities during a chase and will take a while to master, but can be used very effectively in many different ways during chases. When all five generators are completed, the two exit gates get powered and you are briefly made aware of their locations. To open a gate, hold mouse one until the bar fills up, but hold off on opening the gate entirely until everyone is safe and in a position to escape. If a gate is opened early, it will trigger endgame collapse. There is now a two minute timer and all alive survivors must exit before that timer runs out or they will die. If a survivor is downed or hooked during the endgame timer, the timer will slow down a little, giving you a chance to save that survivor and escape together. That is why it's very important that you wait until everyone is ready to escape. You do not want to trigger endgame early. If all other survivors die and you're the last one left, don't lose hope. You still have a chance to escape by using the hatch. The hatch will open when you are the last survivor left. It generates this sound effect to help you find it. As a survivor, it's important that you find the hatch before the killer does. If the killer finds it first, they can close it. The only way to open it back up is with a key. Keys can also unlock the hatch if other survivors are alive as well, just as long as it has spawned. The hatch will spawn when one more generator than the number of alive players is done, so if only two survivors are still alive, three generators must have been done for the hatch to spawn. If a killer closes the hatch, the exit gates will power, but the endgame timer will start. Those seemingly random piles of human skulls scattered around every map are actually called totems. Totems are a mechanic that has to do with a specific type of killer perk, hex perks. Every map has five totems. If a killer has a hex perk, one of these totems will be lit up with a burning candle. To get rid of the hex, you have to cleanse the totem by breaking it. Once the hex is broken, the killer loses that perk's effects. Even if the totems aren't hexes, it can be good to break every totem for both the points and to avoid the totem becoming hexed later on in the match. As a survivor, by default, you will have Dwight, Meg, Jake, Claudette, Nia, Bill, and David unlocked. To unlock the other survivors, you'll need to either buy their respective DLC on the Steam page, buy Oryx Cells, or unlock them with Iridescent Shards. I'd recommend buying the licensed DLC packs from the Steam page and the Flesh and Mud and Spark of Madness DLCs. Buying these two packs will unlock a special outfit for the survivors of Ace and Fang, that cannot be obtained unless you buy the whole DLC. Oryx Cells are Dead by Daylight's version of a paid currency. The player cannot earn Oryx Cells with playtime, but must be purchased with real money. Iridescent Shards are the currency that players can earn with playtime. 
Both iridescent shards and orc cells can be used for unlocking original survivors and killers, and both can be used to purchase a select few cosmetics. Other cosmetics can only be obtained with orc cells, and licensed characters can only be bought with orc cells as well. However, the value of orc cells to real money and the cost of just buying the DLC outright are the same. And if you're just getting into Dead by Daylight, you can purchase a bundle that includes the original game along with a couple DLCs for much cheaper. The survivor that is right for you is completely up to you, but I'd recommend starting off with one of the free survivors, then buying the survivor you like the look of the most. Also keep in mind the cosmetics that the survivor has available. I recommend you start off playing Claudette or Meg, because they have some of the best teachables in the game, even to this day. Teachables are the three perks that every survivor has that is unique to them until the teachable is unlocked. Once a teachable is unlocked, however, any survivor can get that perk. Getting all three of a survivor's teachables can happen by one of two ways. You can either spend your iridescent shards in the Shrine of Secrets, or level that character up to level 40. The Shrine of Secrets is a place where players can exchange iridescent shards for teachable perks. This is great if you want to unlock a certain teachable for a paid character, but don't want to spend the money to buy the whole DLC. The shrine changes every week, and you can check which four teachables will be on it through the official Dead by Daylight Twitter and Discord. The second method of getting a survivor to level 40 is much easier though. By level 30, you unlock their first teachable. By level 35, you unlock their second teachable. And by level 40, you will have unlocked all three of their teachables. I recommend doing this method as it lets you conserve your shards for cosmetics or other character unlocks, and it isn't a guarantee that the teachable you want will be in the shrine. So, if there's a character you dislike, you don't have to level them up past level 40. By playing Dead by Daylight, you will unlock a currency called Blood Points every round. Blood Points are the currency used to level up your survivors. They also serve as your score for that round. By doing any action during a match, such as unhooking someone, working on a gen, or losing the killer, you'll unlock a bit of blood points which add up to your final score and can be used in unlocks on the blood web. You can also spend your blood points on any character you want. You can even spend points you earned as a survivor on a killer. Character levels cap at level 50, and every time you hit level 50, you have the option to prestige that character. Prestiging can be done up to three times, and every time a character is prestige, you lose all of that character's inventory. Go back down to level 1, but you unlock a different part of their bloody outfit. Prestige 1 will unlock their bloody shirt. Prestige 2 will unlock their bloody pants and Prestige 3 will unlock their bloody face. Exceptions may apply. Perks are unlocks on both Killer and Survivor that give the player more options. Perks can greatly affect how you play the game. There are a lot of perks, however, you can only use up to four in a match. Apart from the teachable perks, which we discussed earlier, survivors and killers also have perk options that will randomly appear in the blood web. Perks have many different functions, but fall under a few main categories. Exhaustion perks, healing perks, aura perks, team perks, and self perks. Exhaustion perks trigger the exhaustion status effect, but give the player a short burst of speed or some other buff. This type of perk is extremely helpful in a chase, as it gives the player a chance to make distance from the killer. Healing perks have some kind of effect on healing. Some allow you to heal yourself, others allow you to heal your teammates faster. I recommend bringing one perk that allows you to heal on your own in the event that your teammates are incapacitated. Aura perks are perks that reveal the auras or locations of other players or things on the map. 
Some show you where the killer is. Others show you where generators are. Team perks affect the well-being of your team, but do not necessarily give yourself any personal benefits. And finally, self-perks grant yourself any number of benefits, but do not necessarily do anything for your teammates. If I were to explain what every perk in Dead by Daylight did, we'd be here all day. So I recommend reading the description of the perks that you have unlocked and try them out yourself in a match. Just note, not all perks are created equal. Some will save your life and win the game for you. Others will do absolutely nothing for you. Offerings are a type of unlock that takes up the offering slot. Offerings give added bonuses to players. Offerings are used the second a match starts loading. You will see an animation which shows your offering being burnt, then the loading screen. This means it was consumed and will be active during that match. The most useful offerings are map offerings and point offerings. Map offerings let you choose which map you want to go to, as long as no one else brings a map offering to compete with yours. Point offerings help with gaining blood points and are extremely useful when leveling a character up. Offerings, much like perks, can be unlocked in the survivor or killer blood web. Dead by Daylight has a total of 25 items. Items can be used over the course of a match and can assist you in a multitude of ways. Items, however, have durability. When you use it up, it can no longer be used in the match. If you escape with an item, it goes back into your inventory, but you lose the add-ons. Add-ons affect the usefulness and durability of the item. Of the 25 items, there are six categories. Med kits, toolboxes, flashlights, keys, maps, and event items. Med kits unlock the ability to heal yourself and can be used on teammates to heal them faster. Med kits replace the need for a self healing perk. Add ons for the med kit can affect its healing speed and durability, among other things. Toolboxes unlock the ability to sabotage hooks and can be used on repairing generators faster. Add-ons for the toolbox affect its durability and repairing slash sabotaging speeds. Flashlights are items that can be used to blind the killer. Flashlights are extremely effective during chases as its blinding effects can give you an opportunity to escape. Flashlights can also be used to save another survivor when they are being taken to a hook, but it's really hard to pull off. Flashlight add-ons mostly just affect the flashlight's durability. Flashlights are consumed very fast, only giving you a few seconds of beam time, so use the blinds wisely. Keys are an item that can do many things, but its most common use is unlocking the hatch. Keys by themselves don't do much, but they can be given add-ons which will reveal the location of the killer or other survivors. Maps unlock the ability to track generators, among other things. If you cross paths with something, you can use your map to reveal its location. Maps can only be read for a short time until they are completely consumed. Add-ons for the map can affect its durability. Other add-ons unlock more functionality for it. The final type of items are event items. These are items that can only be obtained during a certain period via the blood web or chests. The blood web is where you unlock perks, items, add-ons, and offerings. The blood web is also Dead by Daylight's leveling system. When one blood web is completed, you level up and are given another one. As you get higher in levels, the blood web expands and the rarity of items gets better. I recommend that you focus on unlocking perks in the blood web first, then going for the cheap stuff as this is the most efficient and fastest way to level up. Perks are the most important thing that you get from the blood web because once you unlock a perk, you can use it as many times as you want, whereas everything else gets consumed when used. An important part of surviving is knowing what your opponent is capable of. It's good to know which four killer perks they're using and what killer they're playing. Each killer has their own unique power. Knowing what every killer's power does can help with knowing how to counterplay it. 
killer powers are not interchangeable. If a killer is, say, Trapper, he isn't going to pull out a chainsaw and down you. All he can do is set his traps. As of June 2020, there are 20 killers in Dead by Daylight, each with a unique power, but I've broken them up into easier to understand categories, Insta-Downs. Insta-Down killers are killers that have the ability to put a healthy survivor into the dying state with one hit, without add-ons. This category includes Hillbilly, Cannibal, Myers, Ghostface, and Oni. Stealth. Stealth killers are killers with the ability to suppress their terror radius and sneak up on unsuspecting survivors. This category includes Wraith, Pig, Ghostface, and Myers. Disruptors. Disruptors are killers that have some kind of ability that can help them during chases. A disruptor's power could also be to distract survivors from their main objective. This category includes Clown, Doctor, Freddy, Trapper, Hag, Pig, Spirit, Plague, and Demogorgon. Ranged Ranged killers are killers that have an ability that can harm survivors from a distance. This category includes Huntress, Deathslinger, Pyramid Head, and Plague. Teleporters Teleporters are killers that can swiftly travel from one location to the next without needing to walk there. This category includes Nurse, Hag, and Demogorgon. Do generators, don't excessively waste resources, save teammates, and heal other injured survivors. Don't just sit around on the edges of the map, hiding in the shadows. The killer will eventually find you. It's better to be an active teammate. Always, always, always remember that the killer is trying to thin out the pack. If you know someone's about to die, try and take the killer's attention off of them by using yourself as a distraction. Remember that four survivors is better than three survivors is better than two survivors is better than one. Play as a team and don't be selfish. Maps in Dead by Daylight are somewhat randomized. Central building locations will always be the same, but the generation of loops, windows, generator locations, and pallets will vary. This means every time you get a map, it will be a little different from the last time you saw it, and it keeps the gameplay spicy. The most balanced map of realms in Dead by Daylight are the Colden Farm maps, Otto Haven Wrecker maps, and Macmillan Estate maps, with few exceptions. These three map realms are the most balanced because they are the oldest maps in Dead by Daylight and have all the conventional map generation and loops. The worst maps for Survivor are the indoor maps. Maps like the game, the underground complex, and treatment theater. By being indoors, everything is much more closed off. It's harder to get your bearings, harder to find gens, and harder to track the killer's location. The game map has two floors, so you can't even trust the terror radius. The best survivor map is Lampkin Lane. Lampkin Lane looks like a suburban neighborhood with a central street. The map is extremely easy to get your bearings on. It has many open houses that you can run into during chases, and it has long fences that can be used to cut a killer during a chase. I hope I was able to help guide you through all the mechanics in Dead by Daylight. Remember to check the timestamps if you need a refresher on anything, and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. It's great to learn by doing, so play a few rounds yourself and see how well you fare. Also note, this video was produced in June of 2020. Dead by Daylight is an ever-changing game, so some of these mechanics may be a little out of date by the time you see it, but I tried to stick to core details. I hope to see you out there in the fog. Stay safe. Bye.